scheduled here our, our room for discussion. My name is Joaquin, and I'm joined on stage by James. Time is running out. It's running out for Earth, it's running out for Earth species, and it's running out for the commuters who are stuck in a traffic jam as Extinction Rebellion protesters blockade the bridge to work. Whether you love them or hate them, you've all heard about Extinction Rebellion. How could you not have? In less than 12 months, they have become the fastest growing environmental organization. They're known for their controversial tactics, with even the Princess of Belgium getting arrested. But who are Extinction Rebellion? What are their aims? And do they have any strategies to reach these aims? Today, we'll be looking at these previously mentioned questions with the representatives for Extinction Rebellion in Netherlands. Ernst Jan Kuyper is a climate activist, climate scientist, and geologist. And Leonard Diller is a climate activist and former student at the, um, at the Amsterdam University College. To welcome them on stage, please give them a warm round of applause.
Extinction Rebellion's goals. Uh, the first of these is um, declaring climate emergency and governments telling the truth. And what is this truth? Yeah, to, to, I think to some extent the truth is, is like abstract. Um, but uh, what, and what, what, what do you mean by abstract? Well, true. I mean, there's always uncertainty in, in science and especially in climate mm -hmm. science. But what I, my, my main problem with the way politicians are talking about this crisis is, first of all, they say it's a, it's a minor issue or, or, or it's, it's like one of the issues. Uh, and secondly, they pretend that they are taking care of it and they pretend that everything's going to be fine uh, while the science is screaming from... Yeah, sure. Is this better? I guess so. <laughs> um, while at the same time, the scientific reports become more and more alarming. Um, but can you, can you give us some uh, details of these reports and the, the science behind the, the truth and well, what yeah, you're trying to say? Well, yeah, just to give one example, uh, virtually all governments in the world signed the Paris Climate Accord, which says that two degrees global warming is the maximum and preferably at or close to 1.5 degrees. Um, if all... Uh, countries in the world do what they promised, so every country makes their climate targets that they have set right now, the planet will warm up somewhere between 3 and 5 degrees. Okay. Um, that's a big uncertainty, of course, but it's far above the, the 2 degrees. And, definitely and that, that's even... including current ambitions or yeah, exactly, current goals. Yeah, exactly. Um, and let me remind everyone that, that these climate so. targets are never met, have, at, at least they have never been met in the past. So it's, it's almost like best case scenario. But why, why is there such a difference between what the IPCC is saying and what governments, the, the science that governments are using and the science that you're, you're saying now that Extinction Rebellion uses as its truth? Yeah, there are, there are a number of reasons, uh, but to go through them quite fast is, first of all, the, the policy is based on the IPCC report from 2014. That's five, well, what is it, uh, seven, five years ago. Thanks. <laughs> uh, and I studied Yeah, you're a scientist. I <laughs> Good with I numbers, you I saying. studied physics, yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, but there are two big assumptions in that IPCC report. Uh, the first one is that um, <coughs> our, our grandchildren or like the future generations will take carbon out of the atmosphere on a massive scale in the second part of this century. So after 2050, mm -hmm. 2070. Uh, there's no technology to do that at this moment. Uh, how we're going to do that is, uh, is completely unclear. And okay. It's going to be massively expensive. Yeah, I, I want to talk about this later because um, the, yeah. the carbon removal question exactly. is, is interesting. But um, I think if I can add to this, maybe yeah, about the course. truth, because um, yeah, we will meet at the COP in a bit and meet with all kinds of activists there. And like one central point also about this truth is that we just look at what is happening right now. All these truths that we think about is often about predictions that are difficult to imagine them. But I think one thing that we really forget are these stories like 54 degrees they had in Pakistan this summer. This is lethal. Chennai, the fifth biggest city of India, ran completely out of water and was supplied with water trains. And these, all these pressures are happening right now in a one degree warmer world. We are shooting through 1.5, 2 degrees, and all of this is becoming worse. And this is difficult to imagine, but when you meet these people, I just met a guy from Pakistan who told me about this. This means death. <coughs> and suffering right now, and this is also, well, we will get into this later, like, this truth means that there's nothing more important than stopping global warming because it's just catastrophic and painful in the very moment that we're speaking. And, and what do you think is the, the maximum uh, temperature increase that we can, as a planet, accept and, and deal with? I mean, that's a, yeah, you are it the scientist. It should be close to zero. I, I, let, there is no climate scientist who will ever admit or say that a two degree warming is safe, bec because it's not. It's a political But threshold. for you, we're beyond two degrees. That's inevitable. Now, that's at least uh, the science that you, you go off, um, whereas the IPCC and governments think that we still have a chance to, cut, uh, to not reach two degrees by, by 2100. We probably still have the chance, but it... it it takes radical action now, okay. and I mean, we, we should be talking about reducing carbon dioxide emissions somewhere between 5 and 10 percent a year. Okay. And at the moment, they're still going up, okay. at least world, world, mm -hmm. worldwide. Okay. So it's like a different order of magnitude of yeah. things that need to happen. And going back to the, the goal of governments telling the truth, in September, the, the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, explicitly said that there is a, quote, climate change emergency. If this is telling the truth, then do you expect on the back of this to see substantial changes? 
You mean that... I mean, uh, there's a politician here, uh, you know, the U.S. Secretary General, a very influential figure, uh, declaring this emergency. Do you think that's enough? Do you think we can trust just that to lead to, to substantial yeah. change? Well, we have three demands, and telling the truth is the precondition. It's something that we demand from the government as a declaration, but also as an active practice. There have been many education programs, for example, 1945 in Germany, many education programs that have really shaped society's education, and this is something that the government for sure has to do. It's not a declaration. It's an active practice of telling the truth. You can invest money into education programs. And that's a part of declaring emergency. And it's a precondition. If we don't, we practice truth-telling, but also the government, then there's no way that we will take the actions that are necessary. If we are but still... Governments and, and politicians, uh, you guys know better than anyone that they're pretty fickle and what, you know, they say one thing and do another. So why, why do you place so much trust in them through this goal that them telling the truth is actually going to, to be the, the, the kickstart to change? Yeah, I think... I've, I've... I think personally I don't trust them anymore because they've known about climate change for at least three decades and they haven't done anything. Um, and that's, that's why we have our, th our uh, third demand, which is the formation of a citizens' assembly, uh, which takes, at least on this topic, the power away from the government and gives it back to the people. Um, and I, I think also the, yeah. think it's important to make a distinction here between if we post these demands to the individuals in the government or to the government as itself. In the end, what we are doing with our actions that are very clearly targeted at the government and not anymore at companies or all these other actors in society that we have become used to governing us is that we empower the government. And uh, if we clearly say that government, we want you to lead us with a third demand in place of having more democratic processes, okay. we empower the government. So it's, it's important to look at this goal in the context of your, your other goals. They are all yeah. definitely, yeah, like we demand three things. And the demand one is a precondition, a demand to the government. Because my, my worry is that it's quite symbolic. It's not actually, with the government's record on climate change, this goal is not going to really do anything or change anything. But you're saying, you know, in the context of your, your three goals with the Citizens' Assembly, which we'll talk about later, that's, that's why you have this goal here. That's why it's in place. Yeah. Okay. I, I think the population in general will never accept the kinds of radical changes that need to happen unless they are aware of the, the, the severity of the crisis that mm -hmm. we're in. Moving on to Extinction Rebellion's second goal, which is achieving net zero carbon emissions by 2025. This is a question for both of you. Do you think that this goal is achievable uh, in a capitalist system? Do you want to take it first? <laughs> I, I th within the current political economic structure, I don't think it is, no. Because w just to give an example, sh we all know about this stuff and Shell is, is planning to increase production 37% in the next decade. I mean, this, we, we have given these companies just a free hand to do whatever they want. Uh, so within the current economical structure, I, I think it's impossible. Um, but I, I, at the end of the day, this current political system is going to end anyway because it's going to destroy the it's going to destroy the uh, um, the uh, the environment within a few decades but and, and is and this I, is this your personal opinion Ernst, or is this a position of extinction rebellion that they don't think the current economic structure is or they don't think solving climate change is viable with the current economic structure Ex what do you, do extinction you rebellion clearly asks for a transformative change of society of transformation of the political system this is what the citizens assembly asks for but also transformation of the economic system for sure um, we don't, and that is something that's very controversial, much debated in society, we don't propose concrete solutions, but that we need transformative change. Also in the way we interact on the social level, psychological levels, is inevitable. Maybe also to maybe give one example more why I don't, or we don't see that it's doable with the capitalist or with the, for example, financial system that we have. Uh, one example that always struck me is Mark Carney, one of the most outspoken bankers or um, like he was the governor of the Central Bank of, um, of Great Britain, he said success is failure. So if we as investors try to engage with the climate crisis, success, so transforming too fast is failure because the financial systems can't deal with this. This shows for me very clearly that we have people in these systems who still weigh a fast response to the climate crisis with other goals, the stability, for example, in this case, of the financial system and continued profits. But he doesn't acknowledge that we are too late right now already, that damages and immense risks are already locked in, and that 
nothing is more important right now than getting it done, transforming our societies and making them sustainable. And so what would you guys say to a, a carbon tax? I mean, there's been, the research has done on the carbon tax. Uh, one Colombian pro professor said with a US carbon tax, coal is basically gone in 2030 and renewables grow to generate nearly half of American power. I mean, a lot of, and Sweden's had a carbon tax that has been effective. Do you think this, this is not enough or? I, I think it's definitely not enough. I mean, 2030 is definitely not going to be enough, and it's only for coal, I, I, I understood. So, um, but, so, but it might be part of the solution, um, and an increasing tax each and every year, an increasing, car, an, an increasing carbon tax each and every year. But one of the problems I have with that is that it allows the richest part of society to continue their life the way it is, because they can afford this kind of stuff, while most people can't. And that's what I, that's my personal, and I think that within Extinction Rebellion, most people will agree that that's, that's inherently unfair. Because it's the rich people who have done most, who, who have done most damage to the climate and are still doing it. Yeah, on, that, on that point, sorry, I just, because um, uh, it, for, for me, I think our opinion as well is that uh, a big part of whether climate change can be addressed within the, the capitalist system comes down to dematching growth from emissions. And OECD data shows that uh, developing, sorry, developed countries are more able to do this. They have better technology, infrastructure, resources, whereas developing nations can't. And so why should developing countries have to, to forfeit improvements in their prosperity just because of historical pollution of the global north? Why? You mean uh, the climate yeah. justice question, if they are required to do it uh, because yeah. of historic emissions? Or? Yeah, I mean, if they're, if they're to cut their emissions, it's going to be very, very hard for them to, to grow. Whereas for developed countries, the data suggests it, it's easier because it's easier to dematch growth from, growth from emissions. I mean, ultimately, so the point that we are making is that we have too much CO2 and other forms of destruction of biodiversity right now in the air, like it doesn't, it's not just about incremental decrease towards some kind of lower carbon economy. We need to get out of these emissions. And uh, that holds as much to the countries that emit the most, like the Netherlands, per capita in this case, um, but also for other countries. And for me, it is very clear that um, developed countries for two reasons have to do, act faster because they have the capacity to do it and because they have the responsibility. But this 2025 goal, that's for all countries developed or developing. No, that's not true. Like we, no, as, sure. we in the Netherlands have the demand of decreasing carbon emissions to 2025. And so far, and I think that's a weak point that is currently much addressed with an Extinction Rebellion, is that our demands are very much focused on our governments, on our national governments, and there's not really a global strategy. And, and yeah, on that point, I mean, if the 2025 goal is just for developed countries, then and over the next century, it really looks like developing countries are going to be the ones, you know, driving you know, growing rates of pollution, growing rates of CO2 emissions as they grow, then what will this goal really achieve? Well, I mean, it's a, again a national necessary precondition. Like, we are here in Extinction Rebellion Netherlands, and there's a reason why we are here organized to address the national government, because it's easiest for us. Of course, it has to be a global transformation. This is also why I believe these discussions are happening right now in Extinction Rebellion, but also from outside of Extinction Rebellion, addressing the responsibility of national governments outside of their own borders. The Netherlands, for example, can do a lot to empower other people, other countries, through technology transfers, through financial transfers, to transition faster, to transform their societies faster. faster. Let's take the exploitation of soil in the Amazon. The Netherlands has a lot of agency outside of their own borders, and this is a discussion that is at the moment happening, and we don't have a fixed position of this right now as Nether uh, it's Extinction Bay Netherlands, but I think this is where we are going towards. In the end, it's not about responsibility, who has to do what or who has to do this. Like, the Netherlands has to do just whatever it takes to, to address its own vulnerability. Like, it doesn't have things anymore in its own hand. So if it can decrease its emissions, of course it has to do it. And if it can support other places to do it, then as well. Because it's a global problem. When we started discussing about the capitalist system, uh, you argued and said that net zero carbon emissions couldn't be achieved by 2025 within a capitalist system. So what would be the alternative solution that Extinction Rebellion is proposing? I mean, yeah, I think that is by now, people who know a bit about Extinction Rebellion clear, and also with the discussion that we had right now, Extinction Rebellion does not say what exactly has to happen, but proposes a process. Government declares a climate emergency. We want the government to come up with a plan to make this transition. 
and this plan is backed up by the process of a citizens' assembly. We don't have a concrete position. We discuss it, individual local groups come but, up with... But, but saying that it can't be achieved within a capitalist system is a concrete position. It is a concrete position on that we say the economic system and the political system needs to transform, but it is something very different to say that it has to transform and to say what exactly the format is that we want to come out of this transformation. So who do, you think, who, sh who do you think should come up with this? You know, it's government's role to, to decide how to shift to a completely different structure of our economy. I mean, that sounds, that's what you're saying? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I mean, first, the, there is, of course, the third demand of the citizens' assembly. So, like, I think in the UK right now, I find it very interesting with the three demands bill that they come up with, in which they lay out how this citizens' assembly could concretely look like. In their case, indeed, the government would have a quite central role in coming up with the solution, but it would be backed up by the citizens' assembly with randomly selected citizens that meet for six months, uh, ten yeah, weeks or so in a row. Yeah, we, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll get on to okay. the citizens' assembly now. But that this is the that bridges to nicely to So our, let's move yeah. on to the third section, which mm -hmm. is that the third goal of Extinction Rebellion is that you should be uh, beyond politics and you should implement a citizens' assembly. To start with, how can you explain what being beyond politics actually means. What does this entail for Extinction Rebellion? It is very much what I already said. Like yeah. we, we don't say how exactly these solutions should look like, but we just point at the necessity for transformative change and propose a process of how this change can look like, uh, how this, this plan from the national government could be developed. So why did Extinction Rebellion decide it to be apolitical? What's the thought behind this? Um, from my perspective, it comes very much... Okay, like I haven't studied actually exactly this case because it was developed in the UK in a specific political context uh, also of Brexit. And I think it also comes to a degree from a position of weakness that we just see there is so much tension at the moment in society and it needs to be a transformation in which big parts of society are involved in. And a movement that has a political stance will probably not be able to mobilize this big support in society for this transformative change. And so they said, okay, we propose a process, a more democratic process like the Citizens' Assembly, instead of trying to mobilize as a social movement, which will take ages to create this uh, consent in society. But uh, do, do, you think, uh, uh, do you think climate change is a political problem? And Leonard as well, do you think it's a, something that's a political issue? Yeah, definitely. I, I, it, or at least it can only be solved by, by, by politics. Yeah, uh, Extinction Rebellion is so, apolitical. I mean, to, some, to some extent, it's, it's similar to fighting a war. You cannot fight a war on your own by sending individual soldiers to the front. You know, we have to do this collectively and together. Uh, but the government should take the lead. And right now, they only talk about it, but they're not doing anything. But um, it, it just seems weird that a, you know, an apolitical organization, Extinction Rebellion, says it's beyond politics, yet mm -hmm. the change you want to see, the problem you're talking about, is an inherently political problem. Doesn't that seem a bit contradictory? Well, I mean, for me, it is when I look at the German case, actually, uh, things become for me much more clear because <coughs> there we already see, although it's also now happening slowly in society, that these conflicts that happen because people feel suddenly the necessity to transform our societies. Here it's with a stickstoff crisis, I guess, with the nitrogen crisis, where uh, the first time becomes really obvious that. But in, in Germany, we have so much friction right now and so much conflict that is now popping up. Um, people starting to not believe anymore and the media and whatnot. And I think like people use this term of social tipping points that these frictions will ultimately, like they are the first ones that endanger our societies. And we, if we don't have more democratic processes like the citizens assembly in place, then I'm afraid of these conflicts first and then the ecological. But we're, yeah. Forgetting the, the citizens assembly for now, we're talking about the fact that you're beyond politics. I think we just don't quite understand what this means and especially, as you said, with the advocating for a citizens' assembly, addressing a political problem, how is it really that Extinction Rebellion is beyond politics? It seems like a very politically driven organization. We, yeah, we, we focus on politics, yeah, sure, of course. But I, I, I think the, the whole sticks of crisis, the, the like nitrogen crisis we have now, is a very good example of what we will be seeing more in the near future. Because at the end of the day, we need to solve this crisis by rationing there is enough oil in the ground to heat up the planet by 10 degrees. So we cannot, we cannot use it all. There's enough fertilizer to destroy all life in the fields, etc. So we cannot use it all. Um, but 
what we see now, and, and that's the same with the, with the like nitrogen crisis now. We can only use, we can only emit so much nitrogen compounds. Uh, but what you see now is that the, the, the group that is best organized and has the most like force behind them, those are the ones that can emit the most. But how can Extinction and Rebellion solve this nitrogen, Dutch nitrogen crisis if you claim to be apolitical? Doesn't that just limit yourself, your capabilities? I, I, I think if, if Extinction Rebellion were asked to solve this, then we, we would form something like a citizens' assembly as well, where farmers are, are sitting on the table together with uh, the people who build, the, the, the people who, who drive their cars, etc. And, and, and also some scientists, because the science is quite clear. We cannot continue to emit these nitrogen compounds this way. But everyone needs to be included in that discussion. And now it's really top down. The government says who, whatever has to happen without communicating to the people who are involved uh, by those decisions. Ernst, let's go on to then discussing citizen assembly. Can you briefly explain what citizen assemblies are for the audience? Maybe it makes more sense if I do no. it because yeah, 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 the yeah. political. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, a citizen assembly is inspired by all kinds of our citizens' assembly demand is inspired by all kinds of other citizens' assemblies that have happened in the past. And the idea is that you take a random sample of uh, the population, mostly the people who are affected. So let's say for the sake of simplicity, the citizens of the Netherlands, you take a random sample, 100, 200, 500 people. Um, you have an independent organization that's run this process and selects experts that propose, uh, that explain the problem that is out there and also possible solutions. And then you have several sessions in which these people deliberate in a facilitated way about possible solutions and make recommendations to the government. Importantly, it is beforehand defined how these uh, proposals uh, would affect the government. So in the UK case, for example, it is clearly defined under what conditions these recommendations are binding, under what conditions they have to be considered in a certain process. Um, yeah, and that is the setup of the citizen but assembly. It, so we've been discussing that uh, accession rebellion is beyond politics. Right. But citizen assembly is an example, a clear example of participatory democracy, yeah. right? It's a change to our way of democracy. Yeah. How can you claim to be apolitical when you are clearly trying to change how we do politics? Yeah. Well, maybe, so actually also within the movement, there are a lot of people who criticize the term apolitical. Like, what we do is we propose this process. We have these three demands are very simple, and this is what we want. And again, what we mean with apolitical, which is very confusing, which also led a lot of people to not use the term apolitical anymore, is we don't propose concrete solutions, but this process. Um, and this is what we mean with it. And I think there's then no, no contradiction for me beyond that. In the Irish case, which is taking as the standard citizen assembly case, there were mm -hmm. clear issues with the random stratified sample. Mm -hmm. And there's also been, citizen assembly has been criticized because it lacks uh, members' uh, retention, and there, for instance, people with high inc uh, low income have been unable to join city assembly just because of their uh, lack of time to provide for this uh, voluntary public work. Mm. So how could, does Extinction Rebellion have a clear solution on how to solve these issues when it comes down to city assemblies? Well, I think uh, two issues there as well. You first do stratification through which you can make sure, I don't want to go into detail, but with, through which you can make sure that you have certain, for example, economic strata of society represented in the citizens' assembly. And the second thing is compensation or remuneration of the people who join the citizens' assembly. Ultimately, these people do a service to the society. And I think, like in many crises, people have done services to the society and were remunerated for this. But I how think. can we sh be sure that citizens, which have no knowledge on climate change, even though they're going to be advised mm -hmm. by experts, can solve such a complex issue, issue which has a uh, worldwide scale? Right. Um, first, I mean, it's, they would lie a broad framework. Like they would, together with the government, develop this, this emergency response. Mm -hmm. And I think one thing that... Um, it's for me very clear, like if we put normal people into a room and confront them with the situation that we're in and they don't come up with the necessary solutions or the framework for the necessary solutions, then I think that would be a proof that we are, I'm sorry to say this, but just as stupid as a species to deal with this. I mean, they are the ones who are put into place, they get power. It is clearly defined how their recommendations affect politics, the administrative legislative system and they get all the means to, to make recommendations. And if they don't do this, and many of the solutions are not that difficult, well, are not that difficult to come up with, then uh, this is just like a death sentence for democracy. So I rather trust in that than saying government at some point when we have this Pearl Harbor moment of, whoa, we're in an emergency, I'll let the government do it. 
and I'm willing to get like to do this activism for that, also just in a belief in normal people. Right. We think that it's a good moment to now turn to the audience for some questions. Anybody? No? Oh yeah. Oh, no. You, you got a mic coming, Wait, fellow, don't worry. Yeah. Imagine if there are 500 people randomly selected and you said, we want scientists to be there and farmers and all stakeholders. That, that can't happen with a random sample. Because if you take a random sample, you have no assurance whatsoever that there are scientists there and farmers and people of all stakeholders. Mm -hmm. And imagine if there is 500 or 260 climate skeptics in the room. Would you accept? then the outcome of such an assembly that goes against climate change and is skeptic of it? Right. Uh, well, okay, I, I simplified the story a bit about the Citizens Assembly. Like, it's not a random sample, but it's a stratified sortition. So what you do is you take a random sample of, let's say, 30,000 people. And then of these 30,000 people, let's say 2,000 people say, yes, I'm down to do it. What you do then is stratification. So you take like certain characteristics, like gender, like place of residence, eventually income, although it's a tricky one, certain characteristics. And then you say, we look at society and how these, these characteristics are distributed in society, like 50-50 gender more and more. Well, sorry, like the thing is with gender, um, it's difficult to get information beyond the binary. But um, you stratify and you make sure that according to these certain characteristics, uh, the citizens' assembly is representative. And that's the ones who make decisions. And that's something um, very, like, it, in addition to this, they get advice from experts, which are scientists or people who are experienced in, for example, nature restoration, and from stakeholders, so let's say people who work in the fossil fuel industry. So you have a distinction between the ones who make decisions and the ones who give input. Um, and while well, so far it has worked quite well, and statistically it's quite unrealist, un unlikely that you get a skewed representation of, for example, a characteristic like climate skepticism. Yeah, I hope that explains it a bit. Ernst, did you? Yeah, I, I, I completely agree. It's just that about the climate skepticism. I also think that to some extent these people are just angry at stuff being taken away from them without having any influence. This is a gut feeling I have. I, I, don't, I think that most people do know that things have to change. It's just that it's the government, this higher power, is taking stuff away from them w without them having a say in what's happening. Uh, and with the citizen assembly, you, 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 you actually give these people a say in, in how their lives will be affected, because, it, because their lives will be affected by, by this, no matter if they like it or not. Um, and, and yeah, indeed, I, I, maybe I'm, I said this the wrong way, but the scientists are there to inform them and give them as, as objective information as, as possible. Um, so, yeah. Leonard, moving on. Extinction Rebellion's <coughs> way of social protest is heavily influenced by the work of Erika Chinoweb. Mm -hmm. Can you briefly explain her arguments? Um, well, the, the main idea is that, well, she looked at empirical studies of past protests and said that if you have a certain percentage of society mm -hmm. um, being an active support of the movement, and she uses this number of 3.5% uh, in the streets, that you create, uh, a, like a, you can have transformative change, a regime change in the cases that she looked at. You just mentioned the 3.5 uh, mm -hmm. minimum percent of population, active population supporting the social protest, which then leads to the changes that protest is asking for. But as you said, her work, uh, Erika Sino's work focuses on throughout the last 100 years on how social protests have been able to topple down dictators and authoritarian regimes. Right. Then the question is, can her work be applied to existing rebellion work, which normally is on liberal de democracies. No, uh, and this is also why the strategy is more and more criticized internally, and people look at other strategies and other, sorry, theories of change. And um, I think that is something that is very valuable about Extinction Rebellion is this, I think, seventh principle of reflection and learning. This idea of 3.5% was in the first 12 years that Extinction Rebellion now exists in the Netherlands, extremely powerful. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> sorry. Um, extremely powerful because it gave a, a goal, something to hold on to as a movement. Yeah. Um, but of course it's a theory and more and more people criticize it and people look at other theories right now. But then, ideas. okay, so you, Extinction Rebellion is moving past Erika Chinoweb non-civil disobedience uh, theory. So what is it moving towards? 
people use this term of ecology of theories of change, and for me this is very powerful. We use different theories of change, um, like Erika Chinovet, that is still prevalent, for example, for many local groups that act, um, but also other theories of change are emerging. Um, for example, I, I won't get into depth with this, but people are thinking about a debt strike that is explicitly, explicitly uh, addressing the financial sector. And these theories of change are existing in parallel. Then we use strategies or so actions that we take to see if we are effective with these and then evaluate on a, well, basically iterative way to see if these strategies prove these theories to work or not. However, for Extinction Rebellion, non-civil disobedience still seems to be the primordial strategy, correct? Yes. And Thank when it comes to support from, from power, uh, from politicians, you know, people that you're trying to get the change from, I mean, sometimes it's, it's not being glowing. I think Boris Johnson described Extinction Rebellion protesters as crusties or something. Um, yeah. um, which, you know, interpret that as you wish. It's, it's but, actually quite, quite nice to mention that Boris Johnson's father joined Extinction yeah, Rebellion. Yeah, he's, a, so, he's an know, environmentalist. It's, it's, yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. You're right to, yeah. to bring that up. Yeah. But, um, my, my, my question just is that uh, when you need this change from, uh, from government and you need support from power, so how can it be a good idea to use your, your radical tactics that you do um, when this just risks alienating the people whose support you need? Mm. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if we want their support. We just, we just have demands. That's why they call demands. Uh, it, we, we, we want to put so much pressure on the government and on society that they have to accept this. I mean, you, when you try to overthrow a dictator, I'm not saying we're living in a dictatorship, but when you overthrow a dictator, you're not asking him politely to leave. You, you, you basically put so much pressure on him that, that the system starts. But as well being said, our system is a liberal democracy, yeah. so consensus and support, uh, they, these are valuable things that mm -hmm. you guys need. Now. And especially, like, two things on this. Like, first, you took the UK example, and there as well, like, we have these different theories of change, and... Radical, disruptive, nonviolent action is one, but another one is this truth-telling actions that we do. So we actively reach out to political leaders, people in finance, people in different industries, and do this truth-telling issues of really confronting people with the crisis, with the grief, whatever. And this does change a lot of people, people in finance. I just heard it, I was, just came back from the UK, a lot of policemen who were called to London to enforce the, well, to transport away the people, they called sick on that day. Uh, disproportionately many. So these issues of truth-telling that we're doing, like these tactics, also work. And then you use the UK example that is very different to the Dutch system because in the Dutch system, political parties tend to take up issues from new social movements much quicker. And parties like Partei for the Dieren, Bayern, or other, people, uh, other parties that are small and uh, tend to work together well with um, movements are taking up the issues. And then maybe a third one is the change of discourse. Like, yeah. everyone is talking about the climate crisis yeah. right now. Suddenly, yeah. the term of emergency is changing the way we think. And this also affects people like Boris Johnson, even though he's switching over maybe into a different, like, into confrontational mm -hmm. mode. But it does change the discourse that we're using in society. So it's more than just this confrontational, nonviolent, direct action that okay. we're doing. Although it's the main one, the yeah, main fundament. there are other, fundament. other things at play. And uh, when we were researching this interview, Wacky and I, and we were thinking about this section, and we thought that um, social movements come down to two things fundamentally, uh, attention and support. Do you think this is fair? Or? Uh, what do you mean with they come down to it, like to well, be effective? In, yeah, in terms of efficacy, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, the support is in the end uh, very much uh, related to attention. But that's the know, thing. That with, for Extinction Rebellion, we feel that's, that's not the case. We feel the more you guys raise attention with your, with your strikes, with your protests, mm. the more the support from the wider population decreases. Yeah, and that's, so if I can just respond to this quickly, that's an analysis that's definitely now hitting in. I think the first 12 months were extremely effective. I mean, we should not forget that we had 1,000 people in front of Satsaudeskade, which hasn't, like, especially in the Dutch protest culture, not really happened before. So I think it's not fair to say it was not effective in gaining attention and support. But now it, it does reach certain limits to, to growth, if you want. Mm. Um, and people, I think, but this is something we're talking about the future of XR, but I think the tactics will change towards more confrontation towards the people who are very clearly historically responsible, like the government, but also the financial sector or the certain energy sectors. Um, because it doesn't make sense to use the, the story like to block tubes mm. um, and hit the normal people. 
So I do think that for the next months, these tactics will change, but I can't say this the name of the movement because these are tactics that will be chosen in the next weeks. But the, yeah, so you're, you're saying your strategy is very much uh, evolving as, as you go, kind of you've had your first year and it's been very successful, but you think for the organization to move forward, uh, change needs to, to happen in how you go about. Yeah, for sure. I mean, like just one thing already that we lo lost now one year, like where you made the demand for 2025 a year ago but now one year passed and the window is closing and mm. also more and more destruction of, like for example, we have more knowledge about sea level rise by now and Extinction Rebellion is not anymore just about avoiding the climate catastrophe but also to promote the idea of deep adaptation, creating a society, a community that is more resilient towards the shocks that we get and all these things are changing in a very quickly changing world and this is why it's important that- and You guys have to react to that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And do you think that in the future, because we've, you know, in the, the previous section when we were talking about capitalism, you said that you, you guys don't put forward policies. This is something you yeah, have been criticized for but it's something that's fundamental to, to who you are in that you, 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 know, you say this is the problem but you don't necessarily lay out concrete proposals for how to, to go about solving that. And do you think that's, that's something that could change in the future? Yeah, I, about that, I, I mean, it's quite clear what needs to happen when we, if, or at least if, if we go carbon neutral by 2025. I mean, it's, there, there are a few pillars in our society that, that are enormously polluting, like air travel, for example. Uh, but in the Netherlands, also our animal agriculture industry, which is completely unsustainable, in not just only from carbon dioxide emissions, but also from uh, mm. biodiversity destruction, the whole nitrogen stuff now. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's quite clear what needs to happen. It's just that we do not want to describe policies themselves, because, we, because then that would not be democratic, because then we would push certain um, policies forward. Uh, right. adding, uh, yeah, sorry, quickly adding to this is also the distinction between our demands and the engagement with solutions. I mean, there are citizens' assemblies popping up everywhere right now in local areas in the UK, and they are engaging with solutions in parallel to the government, hopefully picking up our main national demands right now. So I do believe that we need a society-wide conversation that also Extinction Rebellion can encourage uh, about solutions. But it's something very different than demanding these concrete things from the government. Awesome. Um, Ernst? Extinction Rebellion strategy often involves getting you, uh, its members arrested. We were talking before the interview how you both met at the beginning and then you were arrested together. However, uh, this can be alienating for people that uh, do not have the opportunity to get arrested. Uh, Richard of the Earth, uh, grassroots movement, uh, recently wrote a letter to Extinction Rebellion saying that it was excluding people of color, black and, black and brown from getting arrested just because of racially um, structural inequalities. So don't you think that this reinforces Extinction Rebellion privileged white image? Yeah, th there, there is indeed internally quite a, quite a lot of criticism on this topic. Because, and, and it is true, I mean, we live in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, like, yeah, in a rich and wealthy country and I'm like the white privileged guy. I, for me, getting arrested has not so serious consequences. Um, and I realize that. So being able to get arrested for a certain cause is a form of privilege as well, which I, I, I actually am proud to, to, yeah, to actually use for the people who do not have that privilege. Uh, you um, mentioned that Extinction Rebellion has a lot of internal discussion about this topic, yeah. but what are you actually doing, implemented, trying to solve this issue? Uh, yeah, we, we have a new circle uh, who's working on that, they're called Radical Inclusivity. I'm, I'm not sure what they're actually doing. There, there's so many new circles popping up now that I, I, I don't know, but it's, I have a feeling. Yeah, it's know. comparable to what I just said, that there's this discussion about diversity of theories of change, like questioning, Shinoveth, uh, but the same is also happening with strategies. I think the fundament of Extinction Rebellion's tactics will remain non-violent, direct action, especially blocking streets and blocking uh, physically buildings because it's just for the media very attractive but other forms of non-violent civil disobedience will emerge I'm pretty sure something like death strikes what I already mentioned but also I think we have to open up the window much more for other tactics that can just exist in parallel and allow people a space to get active for sure and I don't see a reason why this contradicts each other like mm. inclusivity you don't reach through having every mm. action inclusive for everyone but just mm. having a whole diversity okay. of actions existing in parallel yeah, yeah and 
and yeah, and I think it's important to mention that like uh, last October at the Stadhouderskade, we I think about 150 people actually got arrested out of a thousand. So we we. If you join Extinction Rebellion, you can basically mention if you are an arrestable or not. That's 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 how we call it, which means you are willing to get arrested or or not. Um, but it's roughly 80 to 90 percent of the people will not get arrested because either they can't, they won't, they well, they fear their job, etc. And that's fine because mm -hmm. we need these people to do to have uh, to have other tasks actually. Uh, and, and from from last October, we know that Amsterdam can lock up roughly 100 to 150 people, and then the system breaks <laughs> breaks down. So um, that's that's yes. the good news. Yeah, and I think as you said as well, Leonard, it, it comes down to an inclusivity thing, and that's you know, a big a big part of, of of what Extinction Rebellion is about. But it, I get slightly confused because I hear that this is a big part of Extinction Rebellion. Yeah, at the same time, your tactics are radical, they, they disclude certain people, and from a, from a political point of view, um, I know you, you're technically beyond politics, but I think it's, it's no secret that the majority of people who are involved in Extinction Rebellion, who support what they're doing, are, are left-wing. But, uh, I mean, maybe you disagree, but that's, that's the impression that I got from research and from the meeting I went to last week. But also out of like, I mean, certain left wing is also like such a statement because like certain issues like being for further uh, continuation of the financial system that is often attached with right wing uh, political positions. It's also just certain positions are just also contradictory. I myself got in like adapted certain views on society throughout the last 11 months that are much more what people might call left wing. But mm. some of these positions are also just... Uh, like what is necessary in my perspective. But the, the reason why I bring it up is, is because <coughs> a lot of the language you use as well is uh, traditionally the um, left-wing moral binding frames. If, so you talk about protecting the environment, caring for the planet, ecological justice. Mm. These are terms that resonate with, with people with left-wing views. Um, but there was, a, there was an, you know, it's, well, there's been a lot of research in, that's shown um, that you can shift conservatives' position on the environment towards a more pro position if you use their, their language, such as obeying authority or defending the purity of nature. So in, in your messaging and in your, in your rhetoric, do you think you could be cleverer with how you use your, your words to try and get a more a co a larger coalition of support across political views? I don't think that protecting the environment is a particularly left-wing position because there's a reason like... But it's not, it's not the position, it's the word the, the protecting. Language, yeah. Is, yeah, it's the yeah. language. Well, I, maybe, yeah, there's a point to it. Like, I think the initial talk that there was of Extinction Rebellion has very much... It talks about the social contract that was broken, which is, from my perspective, not particularly left-wing. We address the national government, which is often looked at from a very confused perspective, like you want to empower the national government. We use words of duty, and maybe, yeah, we can be more diverse in the messaging that we use. But why um, haven't you been more... Sorry, what? Why haven't you done that already? It's actually not my perspective. So, like, in many talks that I've seen, uh, I don't have the perspective that it's necessarily a very left-wing messaging. Um, I, this yeah. has been pointed out in different articles, okay. CNN, uh, Daily Mail, especially when you refer to, for instance, uh, let's save the planet, protecting the environment, so you, do you completely disagree with this, even though it has been already argued and criticized by many mm -hmm. different people? Mm. Well, like, I guess what you mentioned is that if like, we don't want to have necessarily a messaging that just uh, applies to the people who are in the movement. So mm. um, I'm not aware of this particular point, but if it's something that alienates people because of the language that we use, then I don't see a reason why we shouldn't learn from that. Well, if you want to hire better. us for your political strategy team... No, or... please. <laughs> Actually, uh, yeah, we need more people. Uh, Leonard, your uh, Extinction Rebellion's actions especially blockade, uh, die-ins, uh, disrupt innocent people's lives. Previously in this uh, interview, you mentioned that two protests in London. Mm. Uh, so this question is, um, clearly this shows that there are some limits to non-civil disobedience, right? After the two protests in London, Extinction Rebellion's different representatives and leaders came out apologizing for those events. Yeah. So the question is, what are those limits to non-civil disobedience? For me, it's much more, sorry for not answering the question, it's a limit to decentralization. Um, because most people in the movement, there was a feedback, like, was a feedback process. People proposed this action, they wanted to get feedback. And thousands of people in the movement said, no, you should not do this. This is stupid. 
this is blocking the wrong people. And they did it anyways because of the decentralization value. The decentralization value, the 10th principle of Extinction Rebellion says people can take action if they believe it's in line with the 10 principles and values. And they believed so, although most other or a lot of other people didn't think so. And there we see that we need to have better processes of well, engaging with this question of decentralization. But then when do those <coughs> limits of decentralization come into play? Well, if it hits the wrong people and if it's not effective. But what are those, those wrong people? People, for example, in this case, who have very little responsibility or um, um, historic responsibility for the problem that there is and are already vulnerable in society. All right. When it comes to something as urgent as climate change emergency, and, uh, do the ends always justify the means? No. What do you mean by that? What, what, like, can you give an example? Or? It so means what? to what extent can your actions be justified in any scenario or any case when tackling climate change? Oh, yeah, I, I, I do think this particular action was not justified because it targeted the wrong people and, and there was indeed quite a lot of uh, internal discussion about this. But I, I personally, I do think this is the biggest cr crisis we're facing by far. Um, so, yeah, for me, it cannot be radical enough. But when, would you say that as long as you target the correct people, which seem to be politicians and rich and uh, elite uh, sections of the society, then there are no limits into what Extinction Rebellion can no, do? No, I think as, as, Yeah, oh, sorry. As long as it stays within our ten values, like non-violence, we stay respectful, et cetera, et cetera. And ultimately, um, I already talked about this issue of social tipping points and eco-fascism that we already saw that there's a lot of hatred at the moment being created in our societies through this acknowledgement understanding that there will be a lot of pressures on our societies and these are very dangerous so i think it's first of course a moral question what kind of society do we want to create a society of compassion mm. or society of hatred but also if you don't care at all about these morals from a pure effectiveness position we can't if we sow more hatred we will not get anywhere as a movement or as individuals. But you just mentioned the eco-terrorism and eco-fascism, which were uh, <coughs> clear examples of this uh, hatred growing up, are the shootings out at El Paso and the Christchurch, with afterwards the shooters left these notes, which obviously linked to uh, this environmental, had environmental links, which and for the audience, eco-fascism is normally when, is understood as when people do killings of minorities for the sake of tackling environmental change. Now, if, Extinction Rebellion claims to be apolitical, don't have morals, then don't you think that it somehow attaches, how are they tackling uh, this issue? Extinction Rebellion, okay, let's really get this position of apolitical clear. What is meant with this, and that's maybe not well expressed, and there was, again, much yeah. criticism within the movement, is we don't propose concrete policies. Extinction Rebellion stands for society of compassion, of love, of no hatred. We are, there's a reason why we have the principle and value of nonviolence. This is what we stand for. And whatever maybe this term of non apolitical might confuse people, we stand for nonviolence. So if there are people who are killing people in a church, that's something that just doesn't fit Extinction Rebellion. But we can also not do anything about it, unfortunately. I wish I would be more powerful and could have stopped this person. But these issues are popping up. People are referring to these kind of tactics. And there's a limit to what normal citizens like we, who have very little power, can do about it, I think. Do you think they, in your, you know, the conversations you have internally, uh, to what, what uh, do you give this uh, attention? Do you feel that, I mean, certain certain people, certain um, articles we've read, or um, one in particular, argued that your popularity, your, um, you know, that how you've put climate change at the forefront of of people's minds, of of, of uh, political discourse, has that led? Is, do people kind of is there a bandwagoning effect where people radicals jump, jump onto that and use that success, but in a way that's not intended by Extinction Rebellion. I, I saw one case of people completely abusing uh, the, the symbols of Extinction Rebellion here in the Netherlands, and that we also distanced ourselves very quickly, uh, quickly from it. I don't want to go into details with it, but yes, mm -hmm. it's happening. But so far, what I see is that the value of decentralization and giving people the opportunity to pick up this, these principles and the structure and get empowered to take action was much more valuable than having a centralized organization that checks for every person if they, what actions they take, because that will never allow us to grow quickly enough to face this crisis. So yes, this does happen, and we try as a decentralized movement to learn how we engage with these situations in which it gets abused, or especially on the borderlines, mm. but it's 
compared to the success that we had and also to the cohesion that created in society or at least within the movement within the movement mm -hmm. i think it's it's so marginal, marginal at least in the netherlands okay. Uh, we're going to have now another section for questions from the audience. Can we have the white t-shirt, please? I know. Good morning, boys. Thanks for coming. As someone who's beyond politics, do you still vote? Yeah, I do. Uh, I'm not going to say who, but I guess you know. Um, yeah, no, it... it it's, it's, it's limiting the damage, I think, voting. But I, I don't believe my vote really matters. I mean, different, many political parties have been in power in the Netherlands, but also in different countries. And they all, in terms of the environment, they all pursue roughly the same policy. I mean, on details, it's different. But the general picture is still economic growth. And, and economic growth always leads to the extraction of more natural resources. Um, so, yeah, I do vote, but I, I don't have the illusion that my vote will change at as, as least as much as that is necessary. But I'm not sure if you... Are you, are you allowed to vote well, in the Netherlands? I think so. No, 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 no. well, in the municipality. I vote. I think you see a lot of limitations to the representative democracy, democratic system, but I don't think we have the time to completely overthrow like that system. Uh, yeah. Maybe in the long run, but right now we need emergency responses. And the Citizens' Assembly is a good way of mitigating the problems of the representative democracy, I think, um, without completely overthrowing it right now. Yeah, for now. Well, <laughs> the lady in the first row. Um, my question is, do you think it's safe enough to have guidelines uh, to uh, change the political system without having a concrete plan in the sense that that might allow for the space where people might take action um, that's going to go against your final aim but still they would be doing it playing with your own rules mm. there's a danger and I mean we see it already in France and in the UK where the national government is now implementing a citizens assembly for example, in France, on reducing emissions by, I think, 40% by 2030, something like this. I don't know the case very exactly. Um, and this is a clear case where the um, demand is, let's say, not met. But for that, it's important to be clearly, clearly, uh, to clearly formulate what you want with your demands and to be well organized, to not have these incremental steps that the government takes weaken the movement, but to keep up the pressure. But for that, what I mentioned in the beginning, Extinction Rebellion is, from my perspective, so strong and different to Fridays for Future, for example, because it's well organized and able to respond to that. It's not just a loose movement. So it, it is a big danger for sure, but I think with good organization um, and clearly defined demands, it's possible. We can have time for one more question. Oh. Hi, thanks for um, this chat. Um, I came here from work, from IECN, uh, most famous from the red list, and I have one worry that it's still the narrative is a lot on climate, a lot mm -hmm. of carbon, although you also talk about ecological crisis, and so please, uh, Take care, uh, well, take a look at that. Um, my question is more for the political strategy uh, and pragmatic. Next year, there will be a new global deal for nature, the CBD COP. Um, and I'm actually involved for the Netherlands to see what organizations are doing here. And I'm wondering constantly, what, is Extension Rebellion still interested in these kind of global processes? I mean, you do refer to the climate deal for Paris, uh, the Paris deal, for example, mm -hmm. but it's still the government who's going to implement it mm -hmm. with this new deal for nature, which is going to form the policy for the next 10 years in this country. Is XR then going to do something with that next year or is it too different or what, what's your view on that? Mm -hmm. From my perspective, it's something that has been Maybe, I don't know what the intention were of the people who created Extinction Rebellion, neglected in the beginning because the national government is something that people can understand and demands so the national government mobilized people much quicker than demands, from my perspective, to international bodies like UNFCCC or CBD or whatever. But I see right now a shift within Extinction Rebellion, and again I speak from my own perspective what I think what will happen, I don't know what it will be, 
that individual national extinction rebellion groups are thinking about addressing international bodies, but also transnational actors like the global financial system, which is a bit abstract, I'm not very knowledgeable about this. So it might be that the shift will happen there, but there, I think the sentence of who is extinction rebellion, we are you, is very important. I think in the Netherlands, there is some of knowledge lacking in this area, and actually I would like to ask you to join the political strategy group for that, because I think there is a lot of space and opportunity for that. We will go to Madrid to meet people from other Extinction Rebellion groups, to the COP of the UNFCCC in a week, and there we will strategize about exactly these points. Um, and also with biodiversity loss, I think it's a major issue that it's very hard to communicate and we are not good in this now. Um, yeah, really good points, thank you. Thank you for the audience questions. We've got time for, for one more question. Um, Ernst, when I went to the, the Extinction Rebellion meeting last week and you gave a, a training on the Extinction Rebellion talk, and it's clear a lot, a lot of work has gone into this and the, the growth that you guys have had over the last year, both you know, starting in the UK but now in multiple countries, um, and you have, it's fair to say you've made a real impact in um, you know, what, what you've done, at least in terms of climate change at the forefront of people's minds and people talking about it. But my last question to end on is, if you achieve your three goals, will that be the end of Extinction Rebellion? Uh, for me personally, no, it won't. I, I hope that, that this democratization of our society and of the economy is just the first step in, in going further. Uh, for me, but I'm, I, this is my personal view, the... Um, the citizens assembly is, is some kind of um, uh, middle of the road um, um, transition solution, solution. because because I, I, I think we, we, we have to go to a form of, of socialism or, or at least where people are in control of their working space you no know, the people who work in the factory should own them that's my personal belief but the, the, the second you start talking about that about communism fascism socialism mm -hmm. then the conversation gets blurry quite, right. quite fast yes. because no one knows what these words mean. Yeah. Uh, even I'm not sure <laughs> what they all mean. Um, so let's, I mean, first we should solve this. I mean, if we don't solve this within the next few years, if we do not have a radical change within the next few years, yeah, it's basically nothing else matters. Mm -hmm. So I, I hope that if we get this uh, citizens assembly and these people get more involved in politics, they get more involved in decision making, that that, that will be the first step of to people realizing, hey, we, we can actually take matters in our own hands. I, I can decide for my own job, etc. But that's that's how I feel it. I'm, I'm not sure if Exchange Baron has actually a specific... Exchange Baron 2.0. It's a two-track approach, and I think the analogy of the Second World War works really well. We need an emergency response, like after Pearl Harbor that hit the US, where you switch into emergency mode that's very much fast track, and that's the emergency declaration by the national government. But of course we need re-education, we need to make societies that are actually sustainable and are able to deal with issues like biodiversity yeah. loss that are much more complex. We need to transform our whole societies, and this will not happen in five years. It's something that will happen in all our lifetimes, and we need to deal with all the losses that we will inevitably face. Sea level rise is one issue, there's a lot of uncertainty, will displace millions of people. Um, and these are issues that we will continuously have to deal with. There are these conflicts. So two track, like fast track and slow track, is, mm -hmm. is something that Extinction Rebellion in one form or another will continue to engage with. Okay. That's, that's interesting. It sounds like from both of you that uh, you know, it's, it, we're not going to see the end of Extinction Rebellion anytime soon going into the rest of the century. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll see what happens. That's all we've got time for today. Thank you very much for coming. Um, two announcements. On Thursday, there is a Cass Mudder interview. He's a Dutch political scientist. We're talking about populism. Going to be a great interview. Please do come. And secondly, there is actually an Extinction Rebellion introduction event in Crea, just across the bridge now. So if you've liked what you heard, then go over and check it out. And please. if you don't like oh. it. And if you don't like it, go anyway. <laughs> a warm round of applause, please, to, to Leonard and Ernst. <laughs>